Hold on one second. Mr. Brooks, do you have an objection? Nothing I thought I was supposed to I thought I was supposed to be unmuted. You are now. All right. Uh, Attorney Opera, you may start. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, everybody. It's kind of nice to stand here in the middle of the courtroom, you know, all week or the last three weeks. They shoved me at the end of the table because I'm the lefty in the group. It's nice to be able to look at you all and say thank you. Truly thank you. Each and every one of you, I want to express our sincere gratitude from the prosecution team, myself, Deputy District Attorney Leslie Basie, Assistant District Attorney Zach Woodshell. There's no one in this courtroom that does not realize the sacrifice that you've made serving your community in this very important task. You've put your lives on hold. I don't even want to hear from your bosses. Thank you. You've watched these proceedings and you've noticed as we sit at our prosecution table, we don't have a client at our table. But rest assured, we do represent someone. We represent the people of the state of Wisconsin. It's an entity. I can't bring it to the courtroom. People enact laws. People want to feel safe. People have representatives in Madison or Washington, D.C. that set standards, rules, that we all are expected to live by. And when those rules are violated, prosecutors step in and enforce the law. Daryl Brooks does not represent anybody. He does not have a client. Daryl Brooks is the client. Daryl Brooks is the defendant. The state of Wisconsin is the plaintiff. It's really that simple. And it's consistent with any other criminal case you've ever heard about at any other time in any other jurisdiction. It runs the same, no matter what state, state or federal. I'm going to ask you for your guilty vote at the end of my comments. It's up to you. I can't tell you to do anything, except I'm going to say one thing to you that I wholeheartedly ask you to obey. Attorney Upper, I'm sorry for the interruption. Your objection, sir? A mischaracterization of who I am and the way it was said, I feel like it was talking down. All right, your objection's noted, it's overruled. The state may continue. You must not, not, not consider anything about Daryl Brooks other than his conduct in downtown Waukesha on the evening of November 21, 2021. Nothing he's done before that, nothing he's done since that. When you go back to that deliberation room, please obey Judge Doro. Confine your comments to his conduct on November 21 of 21. Is he guilty of the 76 counts that he's been charged with? That and solely that should be your topic of discussion. So, what are the charges against Daryl Brooks? Thank you for your patience in listening to the jury instructions. They must be read for each and every count. But sadly, they can be summarized very quickly like this, as far as the actual counts. Counts one through six are first degree intentional homicide while armed with a dangerous weapon. Counts seven through 67, first degree recklessly endangering safety while armed with a dangerous weapon. Counts 68 through 74, hit and run causing death. Counts 75 and 76, bail jumping, and count 77, battery. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mr. Brooks, what is your objection? Um, I have 76 charges, not 77. It's a mischaracter it's mischaracterization of the charges. Uh, 
That is correct. It is uh, sustained. It should be count 68 through 73, I believe, and then 74 through 75, and then 76. Thank you, Your Honor. I do apologize for my math skills. 68 through 73, 74 and 75 are bail jumping, and 76 is battery. I apologize for that misstatement. We're going to talk about counts 1 through 67 in detail. Counts 68 through 73, hit and run causing death, in my opinion, are easily summarized as this. He never stopped. Never. Bail jumping, he was out on bail for two files in Milwaukee County facing felony charges there. He was ordered to not commit any further crimes. If you believe he can, uh, was involved in any of the conduct charging counts 1 through 67, you should find him guilty of bail jumping. Battery, that relates to the split lip and black eye suffered by Erica Peterson. We told the story kind of backwards. We started with the battery for background. First degree intentional homicide. You've seen this in our opening statement. You've heard it from Judge Doro. Did Daryl Brooks cause the death of the victim, a victim? Did he have, I'm sorry, did he act with intent to kill, meaning either the mental purpose to take the life of another or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being? Count one, Ginny Sorensen. Count two, Lee Owen. Count three, Tamara Durand. Oh, I got, I got. Count four, Jane Kulik, Count Five, Bill Hospel, <clears throat> Count Six, Jackson Sparks. Those are the individuals who lost their lives because of the conduct of Daryl Brooks. From there, we go to reckless endangering safety. What is that? In this case, it means that through his reckless driving, he endangered the safety of other people. And he did so demonstrating utter disregard for human life. Now, behind me is State's Exhibit 15. It's also on the PowerPoint. If you choose, you may have this chart with you in the deliberation room to help you walk through each of these counts if you find it helpful. It's up to you. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. But it will be available for you if you ask for it. And it'll take you, as we did in our presentation of the case, right down Main Street and address all the counts that were involved, all the counts that were charged. To prove reckless endangering safety, and I'm just gonna go back one slide, Nowhere do you see there that we have to prove any degree of injury to anyone. Never once did Je Judge Doe instruct you that somebody has to be physically injured. Now, Detective Casey told you that was the standard we used in deciding of all these hundreds of thousands of people who is included in these charges. And a decision was made by the prosecution team to include people who were physically injured to be efficient in our prosecution. And so everybody up and down the street, I would argue, had their safety endangered that day. I didn't charge 5,000 counts. We selected 60, 61 counts of people that we can identify by name in Exhibit 15 that were injured by the conduct of Mr. Brooks. Those are the people in green, people in red are the fatalities. And we 
presented this case to you in much the same fashion that is presented here on Exhibit 15 as to how the injuries occurred going down that street. So we are absolutely held to our burden of proof and the elements for each offense that Judge Doro instructed you on, but we are not required to prove any injury to anybody. The question is, was their safety endangered by his reckless conduct, his reckless driving? <coughs> now, some of the groups, it's pretty easy. They walked in a formation and you can get a photograph or a diagram and you can kind of see pretty easily who was located where, right? And you can think back to the videos that you've seen for each of these groups and remember, and you'll see them again, the path of the vehicle as it went through each of these groups. This is South Band, of course. All of these names that are being displayed on the PowerPoint Exhibit 21 are on Exhibit 15 in green for Waukesha South Band. Pretty much the whole left half of the formation was endangered by the safety of Daryl Brooks driving up the side of that band. The Extreme Dance Team, it's a little difficult to read, but again, this chart was marked as an exhibit. It's exhibit number 33. If you want it, you can have it in the jury room. The names on this chart will match the names for the Extreme Dance Team on State's Exhibit 15. All of the girls that were struck and injured as they marched with the Extreme Dance Team, plus some people on the back that were handing out candy or serving in support roles as the uh, unit made its way down the street. The dancing grannies, States Exhibit 54, the formation that they marched in, who was located where, and your recollection of how that SUV zigzagged through that group, and you can just see the names and match it up to who was injured and killed versus who wasn't. Now, one of the big things in this case has always been, why did this happen? What was he thinking? Why did he do this? Again, those are things I don't necessarily have to prove to you. His intent I do have to prove, and I submit without any doubt there's overwhelming evidence that this was an intentional act by Darrell Brooks and an act of utter disregard for human life. I say that for these reasons, folks. Number one, first and foremost, just stop driving. That's it. It's really that simple. Not one person had to be hurt that day if he would have just stopped driving. Excuse me, Attorney Opper, your objection, sir? Um, you specifically, can, I'm sorry, can, can I be heard? Your objection, sir? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know if I was on mute or not. Um, You're not? You, you specifically said in your jury instructions that Intent cannot be, you can't look into someone's mind, I think is what it says, to find intent. So how could that be characterized as someone knowing for sure intent or not knowing for sure intent? You're making an argument. You'll have an opportunity to do that later. Your objection's noted. It's overruled. The state may continue. I apologize. We, sh we showed you at the very beginning, remember, our first witness was Sergeant Warner, the man who was the incident commander for the parade. We put up another map. I think it states Exhibit 1. You can have that if you want it. Shows all the positions of all the police officers and the reserve officers, the barricades, the squad cars. 
How do I know it was intentional? Because even Daryl Brooks told Detective Carpenter, I could tell something was going on downtown. No reasonable person would drive upon this area, see the squads with their red and blues on, see the officers in the street with their bright yellow vests, see all the people milling around, see the, pl the floats lining up and the participants getting ready and not know to drive safely, slowly, and obey officers. The barricades help us prove it was intentional. The police presence help us prove it's intentional. The parade participants help us prove it's intentional. And the parade spectators help us prove it's intentional. Excuse me, Attorney Apple, your objection, sir? Speculation as to what the alleged defendant said he saw, it, Sir, it was never. Your objections noted it's overruled. This is closing arguments, not the evidentiary phase. Go ahead and so turn the So how can speculation be made to what was saw? If your that objections was noted, it's overruled. Continue, Attorney Opper. Honking the horn. Quite interesting that Mr. Brooks asked so many witnesses if they heard the horn honking. Some of them said they did at the beginning of the parade. Yeah, I heard a horn honk. Most of them said they didn't. The horn honking cuts both ways, folks. If he's honking his horn, that means he can see something's in front of him. That means he knows there's an object in the road. You can rely on your common experience in your affairs of everyday life. If you see something in the road and you want to alert the other person to your presence, you will honk. But you do not have the green light to then just keep going if they don't move. He knew they were there, intent. I've skipped one, I'm sorry. Going back to my street. Number 15, I failed to include the uh, Catholic community. That's just one of the photographs showing the people that will match up to Exhibit 15 from the Catholic community of Waukesha. There's a lot of photographs identifying the people that were marching with that group. The parade started. This is the starting point or at least near the beginning, right? This is the area. We showed some videos of the groups passing by in this area. We heard testimony from four different police officers standing in four different spots near here telling of their four different efforts to stop him. Intentional. Sergeant Wanner's back here, testified that this red SUV blew by me. I waved both arms over my head. I'm in a police uniform. I have an unmarked squad, but I have my red and blues on. And he blew past me. He gets down here to the corner where Detective Casey is standing. Detective Casey runs out into the street, gets close enough to put his hand on the hood of the car. He keeps going. He comes down, turns on the Main Street, gets in this area of East Avenue to the south and Buckley Street to the north. This is where he encounters Officer Schneider and Officer Buttrin. They each make a separate effort to stop him and he keeps going. Four police officers. It's intentional. He had plenty of opportunity to just stop. Anywhere along the way, one of the officers testified to it. I think it was Officer Schneider. This was an accident, and he mistakenly wandered onto the parade route after passing all this, and he mistakenly wandered onto the parade route. At any point, all he had to do was stop. They could have paused the parade. They could have moved the barricades and escorted him out. He didn't. It was intentional. He went on for four blocks, four blocks. 
It was intentional. He reached speeds of approximately 30 miles an hour. That's intentional. He plowed through 68 different people. 68. How can you hit one and keep going? How can you hit two and keep going? How can you hit three and keep going? Didn't phase him a bit. He kept going until he got to the end and there was no more bodies to hit. It's intentional. Mischaracterization of the evidence. Noted, overruled. His conduct when he left the parade route, we'll get into this. His flight, his hiding, his panic, his desperation to run. Get the hell out of town as fast as he could before the cops came. That shows his intent. His interview with Detective Carpenter, we spent several hours playing you snippets of that interview. How telling was that? Never once did he say any of these things. Never once did he say, like he told you in his opening statement, it wasn't an, ac it was an accident, it wasn't intentional. Never said that to Detective Carpenter. No, he came up with some convoluted story about, I got a ride out here from a buddy in a tan Kia, and then I left to go meet Erica, and we got into a fight, and then I went back, and the other guy got into a fight, and he was leaving, so I took off on foot. Absolutely nonsensical story. Does not match up with the known evidence in this case. Overruled. He never stopped. I didn't even state the objection. This is closing argument. She may continue. I'm going to play this slide, which is a snippet from State's Exhibit Number 53. Go ahead and play with sound, please. It was just a snippet that I selected because I thought it really captured the environment that so many witnesses tried to explain to you, right? It's a Christmas parade. People are there with their families, their little kids, their grandkids, their neighbors, their friends, strangers, standing next to strangers. That's what's going on on Main Street. While that's going on on Main Street, this is going on. Remember this? This is the gas station on the corner of Barstow and North Street. While the units are marching down Main Street, entertaining the crowd, Daryl Brooks is driving recklessly. He's enraged and he's arguing with Erica Patterson. Why is this important? This is important because before he even gets to the parade route, this is how he's driving. He drives the wrong way down North Street and then acts like it's everybody else's fault in the world. Your objection is noted, it's overruled. You may continue, Attorney Opper. When he finally pulls into the gas station, he rolls down his window and yells at the driver who's properly stopped at the stoplight that it's somehow that guy's fault that Daryl Brooks is trying to drive the wrong way down North Street. And from there, the rage continues. We get to this point, State's Exhibit Number 3. Please play.
The video is playing. You can see the pushing match between Daryl Brooks, Corey Runkle, Erica Patterson, and Nick Kirby. Watch this. He turns to get in the car, flips up his hood, and goes and gets in the passenger seat. I'm sorry, driver's seat. How long are we going to mischaracterize testimony? Sir, it's argument. I've heard nothing improper. Your objection's noted. It's overruled. You may continue, Attorney Opper. Thank you. They need to know they can nullify. That's it. He drives off onto the parade route. From this moment, right here on Exhibit 15, you're watching it. He's enraged. He's angry. Flips up that hood, and he zooms past Sergeant Warner, past Officer Casey, onto the parade route. Now, there's no doubt, for the first two blocks, he does not strike anyone. And as we've discussed, some even said he was driving at a reasonable speed initially. By the time he gets past Officer Buttron and Officer Schneider in this area here of uh, East Avenue, past East Avenue, and clearly once he gets past Barstow, that's where it starts, right? That's where it starts. Nicole White, our first victim walking with Remax and the hot air balloon. Knocks her over, keeps going, runs up and over the backs of Waukesha South Band. Hits the green children spectating on the sidewalk, keeps going, runs over Kelly Grabo and her daughter Adelia walk, walking with Burris Logistics, keeps going plows through the entire extreme dance team just before the five points, keeps going, hits Deborah Ramirez and her son Isaac spectating on the south side of the street, keeps going, clears the five points area, hits Jane Kulik square on, causing her to go up on the hood of the car and then fall off and drives over her body. He doesn't stop. He keeps going. Runs through the kids over by the steaming cup. We heard the parents testify about little Brinley and Kelsey and Owen that were standing there outside the steaming cup. They were struck by the red SUV driven by Daryl Brooks. Keeps going, plows through the grannies in that zigzag fashion, striking most of them, injuring them, killing them, keeps going, gets down here to the end and goes through the uh, Catholic community. The witness uh, remember Holly Berg, she testified about that um, mobile gas station incident. She said she was standing down here in this area. She said, I saw 15 to 20 people fly in the air. They look like bowling pins. And when she saw the video, she's absolutely right. It's a terrible description when you think these are human beings, but that's exactly what it looked like. When does the intent exist? Doesn't have to be even for a second. I'm not telling you who set out that morning to cause this carnage. But when he became enraged back here, he didn't give a damn who or what was in his way. He intentionally went on. I'll show you. Motive. I don't know why he did this. Folks, I don't know why other than the rage. He's right. You cannot read minds, neither can I. But the law doesn't require you to. The law gives you a way to reach a conclusion as to what is somebody thinking, and it's right here. 
decide it based on his acts, words, and statements, and from all of the facts and circumstances. I've already been through many of them. I want to show you what I mean. Look at this. Was there room for him to get out? This is way back at the beginning. This is Officer Buttrin's squad video. Way back at the beginning. That's Buckley Street here that you're looking at. Look at those barricades. Look at the sparse crowd. And there's Officer Schneider in her uh, yellow fluorescent vest on the left side of the picture, about to run into the street and stop him. <coughs> intent. I'm going to play this video for you because folks, for me, this is where it becomes crystal clear. You watch this video, the first thing you're going to see if you direct your attention to the left side of the screen is you're going to see him hit Kelly, I'm sorry, Nicole White. Knock her to the ground and keep going. Now, if that was the end of the story, you may sit here and say, Madam DA, I, I don't know how you conclude intent from that. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe he didn't mean to do it. But watch what happens in this video after he knocks Nicole White down and tell me this does not prove intent. Please play. watching the left side of your screen. Out of the same thing. That's intent. I'm sorry to interrupt your objection, sir. How can you tell the jury what they're supposed to think? It's proper argument. Your objection is noted. It's overruled. It's, I would argue that it's I would, I would say that it's improper. And I'm Mr. Brooks, I made my ruling. I'm going to mute you if you don't follow the rules. Exhibit one. Exhibit 152. Clearly intentional conduct. Clearly intentional conduct. States Exhibit 93. We asked the court to take time to have you go look at this car in person because it's remarkably amazing <coughs> that this damage was caused by human beings. That's intent. This is an excerpt from State's Exhibit 154. Maybe a little hard to see. A lot of that laying in the front part of this uh, photo are shoes. Remember what Dr. Vidritsky said about the shoes and the feet, the scuff marks on the toes and the ankles? Look at all the shoes laying in the street. This is the area at the end when he ran through the Catholic community. All the shoes laying there because of the velocity. Remember, the medical examiner talked about the velocity. It's not just the speed, it's the velocity. The power that these people were knocked right out of their shoes. That's intent. The flight, the hiding, changing his appearance. <coughs> he had to go through some effort, right? Crawled up in this uh, playhouse, ditched his sweatshirt and his sandal, the other sandal, 
Seems pretty reasonable. He dropped it when he was jumping over a fence. Changed his appearance. Please play. Excuse me. Intent. What's he running from? What's he running from if he's just a lost guy with no ride back to Milwaukee? What's he running from as there's cops, sirens wailing in the background? Whoops, that was me. So, State's Exhibit number 130. Put that up here quickly. <coughs> Thank you. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, folks. Suffice it to say, after Officer Scolton tried to stop the threat at that intersection at the top, Wisconsin Avenue, and he blew through the barricades there and drove south on West Avenue over to Prospect Court, cutting through the yards and ditching the vehicle on Maple. Heard all the testimony about the commotion on Maple, the eyewitness testimony from Officer Sailors, off-duty police officer who saw this, saw the defendant, Daryl Brooks, he identified him for you in this court, get out and run from this car, and how we tracked him through the neighborhood. And again, the desperation, whether he had to ask or use veiled threats like, I won't hurt you, but I need your phone. He was absolutely desperate to get out of there until he took refuge in the home of Daniel Ryder. Now remember the interesting thing, folks. None of these witnesses in this area knew anything about what happened at the parade. None of them. None of them were there. None of them were there. So they, some of them tried to help. Some of them didn't. Daniel Ryder did. And it's, actually probably a really good thing that he took him in because it stalled, right? It stalled him from keep running, kept him in one place until the cops could close in and get there. Now, Mr. Brooks repeatedly asked witnesses who had just watched their loved ones get struck by this SUV if they happened to catch a license plate. States Exhibit 150, there's the front license plate. Definitely a little blurry, but definitely you can make it out. States Exhibit 151, there's the rear plate. States Exhibit 175, there's Daryl Brooks in his music video with the same car and the same license plate. <coughs> there's the key to the Ford that was found in Daryl Brooks' pocket. There's no doubt Daryl Brooks is the person responsible for this. Because this man in this picture is the same as this man in this picture wearing this sweatshirt. And again, it's a little hard to see, but you can ask for these exhibits in the jury room if you want. The photograph, you can see this design on the front of the uh, sweatshirt, if you look close enough, this is a sweatshirt from the playset that has Daryl Brooks DNA on it, according to the crime lab. That's him right there. That's Daryl Brooks driving off into the parade. That's Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. That's Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. That is also Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. And so is that. And he kept asking people about the tints on the window. Well, guess what, folks? You don't need to see the tints on the window when the windows are rolled down. And there's clearly one person in that vehicle in every one of these photos. And it's that man. And it's that man. And it's that man. Daryl Edward Brooks Jr., date of birth 221-1982, on his 
identification card issued by the state of Wisconsin. In all capital letters, Daryl Edward Brooks Jr. This was in his pocket when they arrested him. So this entire shenanigans that he's presented to you through his questioning of witnesses about I'm not Daryl Brooks and that's my name and I don't know who that is and I don't uh, consent to being called that name. It's just nothing but a distraction. It's Daryl Brooks. It's the man who drove through the Waukesha Christmas Parade and killed people, injured people, endangered the safety of people. Sorry, your objection, sir? Uh, your Honor, with all due respect, I, I would appreciate the, uh, the quote unquote uh, language to, to what, what does she mean by shenanigans and this and that and the third. Sir, your objections noted, it's overruled. The state may continue. Well, can, can she tone that back? Because if that was me, if I would have said Mr. something Brooks, like that, Mr. Brooks, your objection is noted. It's overruled. These are closing arguments. There's nothing just, improper. It's noted. It's overruled. To, she may continue. I just wanted, I just wanted to be fair. You'll have an Honor, opportunity to respond, sir. Please let her finish. So I can, I can rebuttal? Go ahead, Attorney Opper. Thank you. I'm going to conclude my comments with this, folks. I'm going to show you the video, a stitched together video of all the carnage caused by Daryl Brooks, and well, I apologize. It's together. It's together. This is important that you know what he did. It's important that you think about the women like Nicole White and Kelly Grabo and her daughter and Jane Kulik who were just there with friends and co-workers supporting a local business. The teenagers marching in the band representing wearing their school colors. It's important. The boys and girls with the Blazers baseball team and their coaches doing nothing more than handing out baseball cards. The young girls in the extreme dance team. Can you imagine how many hours they spent practicing that routine? We drove right through them without a care in the world. The grannies dancing their way down the street. Perfect step, every one of them. The Catholic community there, as Father Matt said, spreading the light of Christ in the weeks before Christmas. He snuffed it out. It's time for Daryl Brooks to stop running. It's time for him to stop lying. It's time for him to be held accountable for his actions. Daryl Brooks cowardly rammed his way through this parade, violently killing and injuring so many people. I'm gonna stop talking and play this video, but Please, I ask you to add up the evidence. Use the map, 150, I'm sorry, 15. You can check off the names, we've covered them all. Walk down that street like we did with you. Return guilty ver verdicts on all counts. Please. Please. Screen back up. No, I need one more. Uh, Yes, please. Go ahead.
Thank you. Before we continue with Mr. Brooks's closing arguments, I'm going to take a short break. Um, I'll rise for the jury, please. I'm on duty. No. <clears throat> the jury should know that they can nullify. You are muted now. be in recess for about 10 minutes.
Or the record should reflect that Mr. Brooks is now present in the main courtroom uh, prior to reopening following the break. I did invite him back into the courtroom and he is here. I trust you are ready with your closing argument, sir. I'm ready to address subject matter jurisdiction as well, too. That request is denied. Just for the record, I was addressing it for both courtrooms here in courtroom number, I think it's 20. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to bring the jury out. Are you prepared to present your closing argument? I would like for you to prove subject matter jurisdiction on the record, Your Honor. I'm not addressing that any further than I've addressed already, sir. There's a written decision. I remind you of that. In that written decision, did, did I receive a, well, actually, I didn't receive anything. Was there copies made? Mr. Brooks, I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you prepared with your closing argument? I'm going to have the jury brought out. There is no I'm other in, legal arguments I I'm need to address of, from you at this time. I'm informed of what you're saying. I was merely asking, was there copies made of your, you say, a written decision? Sir, my, record, my written decision has been filed into the record. That is done electronically. You are provided with a written copy previously. Are you asking for another copy of that, sir? Yeah, because I, I don't have it. As a courtesy, I'll have my clerk print off a copy and provide that to you. Is it proven subject matter jurisdiction? Your objection to the lack of jurisdiction has been noted repeatedly on the record. It is a meritless argument. I've indicated that in my written decision as to why there is subject matter jurisdiction. And I will continue forward with the final stages of this trial, which I hope include your closing argument and then the final instructions to the jury. I will hope it, it, it proves subject matter jurisdiction on the record too. All right, I will instruct the jury to come out for the record. The written decision is once again being provided to I the defendant. accept for value and return for value this document as it is not based in lawful law. And it does not prove subject matter jurisdiction whatsoever. It refers to a, some complaint that was filed in uh, the name of a trust, not my name. Were you aware of that, Your Honor? Mr. Brooks, the jury has been asked to be brought out. I mean, I requested that they be brought out. They're on their way. Were you aware Please of that? Please be prepared with your closing argument. Were you aware of that, Your Honor? Or is that a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer any questions as a public servant? All rise. So that is a tacit agreement. Record to reflect the jury is coming out. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Go ahead, sir. You may begin your closing argument. I'm not ready to begin closing arguments. So this is your opportunity to provide your closing argument to the jury. Please start. I have uh, started the timer I'm uh, of one hour. I'm informed of that, Your Honor, but I'm not ready to proceed as I don't understand the uh, <coughs> reason why the questions asked before the jury was present were not answered. There, there are issues that needed to be addressed outside of the jury, as you always say, which I don't understand why the jury deserves Mr. to Mr. Brooks, to this know. is your opportunity to present your closing argument to the jury. Please do so. I'm informed of that, but the jury needs to understand the truth, their rights, and their duties, as they have not been informed of their truth, their rights, and their duties. Mr. Brooks, the court has begun the instruction process. Uh, I read 73 pages this morning and into the early afternoon. I have another 
30 plus pages to read. Did you inform They will be informed of the law. Did you inform them that they Mr. can Brooks, notify the law? Mr. Brooks, you do not have that right to request that. And Were I'm they advising informed? you one more time, this is your opportunity to provide your closing argument. Please begin. I intend to. When ready, I just want to know if the jury was informed that they can nullify the law. Uh, Mr. That Brooks, are, you have they no have right the to power. make that argument to the jury. It's true. They have the power. Oh, all right. I'm going to excuse the jury. They should, they should know that they have the power. Please rise for the jury. Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Brooks, you do not have a right to request jury nullification directly from this jury. I direct your attention uh, to the Bajerkas case, B-J-E-R-K-A-S-S, -S, that's State versus 163 Wisconsin 2nd 549. While you are not incorrect that the jury has the power to nullify, they don't have the right to do so and no party has the right to instruct or to request an instruction or to argue jury nullification. You may talk in terms of fairness in general terms, but you may not go further. You may not argue that the jury should discard the instructions and the law uh, and find you not guilty for that reason. You may not use the phrase jury nullification. You've done that now at least three times in earshot of the jury uh, twice uh, while you were in the other courtroom I was able to mute half of what you said the second time and then of course you raised that once again while in front of the jury just now um, you also indicated you weren't um, ready to give your closing argument sir this is the time has come for you to give your closing argument if you choose not to do so at this time then you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument by your conduct. I haven't made any such choice. So you can't coerce me into a constitutional right uh, waiver when I have not waived the constitutional right. And I will not allow you as a public servant to do that. I have not made a choice. Sir, this, the time has come for you to present your closing argument. Are you making a judicial determination that you're denying me a constitutional right in open court I have not court, made such a record. determination as of yet, but you can forfeit your constitutional rights Under by what conduct. Under what lawful law? Uh, Illinois versus Allen, State versus Anthony. Illinois versus Allen does not reference anything pertaining to uh, rights when talking about in closing State statements. State versus Anthony, uh, Illinois the Supreme versus Court Allen. of Wisconsin referenced both that decision uh, when it essentially extended the reasoning or adopted the reasoning of Illinois versus Allen uh, to then find that a defendant could forfeit an important constitutional right by conduct. In State versus Anthony, it was not the right to be present in the courtroom, it was the right to testify. Okay, so no, none of those the that you just named have anything to do with the closing arguments, Your Honor. You, you've used Illinois versus Allen repeatedly to when it comes to me being removed from the courtroom. Not one time did it bring up anything dealing with a closing statement or a closing argument. So how's that same uh, statute being used for something that it doesn't even refer to or pertain to? Mr. Brooks, the Allen decision, Illinois versus Allen, and the Anthony decision, which is State versus Anthony, are two examples of cases where a defendant lost a very important constitutional right because that right was forfeited by the conduct of that particular defendant. And that was to be present in trial, correct? The right to present a closing argument is no different. Because it is not evidence, um, 
It could be said that it doesn't even rank as high as the right to testify, which is guaranteed by the constitutions. Which I was denied the I'm right to I'm not prepared to, to make that to ruling to here me. yet today, but I will tell you this, sir. The time has now come for you to present a closing argument. There will be no further delays. It's I not will a delay. not be taking any further um, adjournments for you to prepare. You were advised yesterday that this court would proceed today with instructing the jury and with the parties making their closing arguments. And you made that while it violating up, my constitutional sir, right. Sir, please don't interrupt me because well, you've now you interrupted did. me a couple of times. No, once. So let's Twice. make that correct. Once. That's the third time. Okay, now you can say so, two. So, Mr. Brooks, I'm advising you yet again. The time has now come. I don't to That's that another name, interruption. The time has now come for you to present your closing argument to this jury. And you were brought back over to this courtroom for that purpose. I'm going to let them That's know. That's another interruption. No, I'm going to let them know that they have rights and that they should be told, informed of the truth. It's not me are trying to give. Are you telling me, sir, that it's you not are going trying to, to give. Dis let me ask you a no, question. Hello. I'm not trying to give any sir, jury instruction. Sir, you're interrupting me and you haven't let me finish. So are you telling me that you are going to disregard my very clear directive to you to not bring up the topic of jury nullification? That's not what I said. I'm asked, that's why I'm asking you. I don't understand that question because that's not what I said. Sir, you may not argue jury nullification I'm to this to jury. I'm going to inform them of the truth. So you're going to inform them that they have the power of jury nullification. They do have the, you just said on the record that they have the power for- Sir, uh, I direct your attention You just said that, did again. you not just say that, Your Honor? Sir, you the said jury, I couldn't instruct them. The jury on has that. the power, but not the right to nullify. Right. A you said party, the power. You said the listen power. Listen to me, sir. You're interrupting me once again. So I'm going to inform them that they have the power. Are you telling me, sir? I'm that not you telling are you no such thing. I just told you what you just said. My directive to you to not raise the issue of jury nullification during your closing argument. That's not what I said. You just read and said that they have the power to. That's what you just said, Your Honor. Sir, State versus Bejerkus says and stands for the proposition that although the jury has the power of jury nullification, ah, they have no, the power. no party has the right to argue for jury nullification. I'm not arguing for it, Your Honor. In I just want them case, to be informed. The, I just want them sir, merely to be informed. You can That's call it. it informing, making them aware. Yeah, they Whether should. They should be aware. You are of the not rights. allowed to make them aware of their power to nullify. That how is an improper them... argument. Your Honor, how can I not inform them that they have a power? How because can I that not, is not inform a right them of a power that have, they have? Sir. I'm not giving a new jury instruction. That That's not what I'm arguing. There is no jury instruction for jury nullification, yeah, sir, not, because not, it's not allowed. I'm not attempting to give them a new jury instruction. I'm merely attempting to inform them of the power that they have. Mr. That's Brooks, not against the law. I'm advising you one more time. You may not raise the issue of jury I'm going, nullification before this jury. I'm going to, I'm going to inform jury. them of the power that they have. I'm not you giving are them, telling me I'm that not you giving are them a jury instruction. I'm telling them about jury nullification. That's, that's what I hear you saying. That's not what I said, though. Don't mischaracterize what I'm saying. You just read and said that they have the power. They have the power to do that. So how how is informing them? It's an inherent them, power that they have. They are not to be instructed on it. That I'm, is very clear in the law. In Your addition Honor. to no, let me finish. In addition to the case that I just cited, I'd cite to you uh, from the jury instructions uh, the law note on jury nullification seven zero five. Um, what that says, sirs, I'm not going to read it all. It's many many pages, but the bottom line is. It is improper for a court to allow a defendant or a defense attorney to make an argument or make the jury aware um, that they have the power to nullify a verdict. And Your Honor, you just added this last night. That's why I had to sit there for an hour in the holding cell and wait for you to change the whole paperwork because I brought that up. So you never intended for this to even be an issue. Mr. Brooks, it never was brought up. If you but think then I when I raised the issue, you Your Honor, let me finish. If you think that I'm not prepared to deal with an argue on jury nullification, I didn't say, I, that's not what I said. 
That's you not what I said. In all fairness, that's not what I said. The record should accurately reflect that you were kept in that holding cell Why was I kept so in there? that my clerk could finish adding the a jury instruction that was not there. Six verdict forms and it's times two because there's a guilty and a not guilty okay. for each. No, let me finish. Her. So, how did, so how did I have, why did I have to sit here for that where I could have just went to my cell and had it delivered? We had this Mr. at the Brooks. end of last at the end of last night before you call recess. I'm not going to debate we had a that whole, topic with we you We had a further. whole conversation about Mr. Brooks, you me are bringing up about the jury nullification. Disregarding this court. You, re Here we you go can with this. roll your eyes Here at we, me because all you want. It's ridiculous, Your Honor. You, you, you just stated that they have the power to nullify would you Any like, law, if you would like, but then I, will I said, read this to you, sir, the part of the case that's important, but you're not letting me get a word in edgewise. I'm trying my best not to remove you to the other courtroom, but that is oftentimes what I need to do in order for this court to make a full record without you interrupting me. But you need to be fully aware that you may not raise the issue of jury nullification in front of this jury. It is not an allowable argument or an advisement or making them aware. However you want to describe that, sir, whatever verbiage you want to put in front of it, you may not do so. And this court has the power and the authority to limit what you say to this jury, even in a closing argument. And if you're telling me through your conduct, through your words, that you are going to disregard that direction, you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument. Under what lawful law? Under State versus Anthony. That's, that, it doesn't refer to that. State versus it, Anthony it may not have dealt with. It hasn't dealt with closing the arguments. The right to a closing argument, sir. It, but the reasoning, you just said nonetheless, it right there is no. fully applicable no, because you can't, the more you can't general change the principle, law your honor you can't change the law that's practicing law from the, the bench law, sir, but the general principle i know you used to be in legislation but you can't practice law from the bench sir i'm you not can't practicing do that. law from the bench I you have, are if you're changing if you're ch your honor I'm not you're making, attempting you're attempting to make a a, a a separate case pertain to something here that it that, that doesn't even pertain to it it has nothing to do with a closing argument. Nothing that you just so, named. Not Mr. Illinois Brooks, versus Allen. I would like to make a record. Would you please show the courtesy and respect for I me will, to do Honor. that? I will, Your Honor. I will. All right. So looking at the Anthony case, all right, and that case starting at Head Note 7, paragraph 54, says the following, and you need to let me get all the way through it. We have recognized two distinct ways in which a defendant may give up his rights, waiver and forfeiture. State versus Pino is the first citation that they reference. Waiver is the intentional relinquishment or abandonment of a known right. Multiple citations there, I won't repeat them all. Waiver typically applies to those rights so important to the administration of a fair trial that mere inaction on the part of a litigant is not sufficient to demonstrate that a party intended to forego that right. State versus Soto. Forfeiture, on the other hand, often involves the failure to make the timely assertion of a right. That's a cite to the Dina case and Olano. Rights that are subject to forfeiture are typically those whose relinquishment will not necessarily deprive a party of a fair trial and whose protection is best left to the immediacy of the trial, such as when a party fails to raise an evidentiary objection. However, there is a second aspect of forfeiture doing something incompatible with the assertion of a right. State versus Vaughn, 2012 Wisconsin Appellate 129, citing Illinois versus Allen, 397 uh, U.S. 337. They went on, the court, that is the Wisconsin Supreme Court in Anthony. As previously noted, we have held that the right to testify is subject to waiver, not forfeiture, insofar as a defendant's inaction in asserting the right is concerned. We now conclude that the right to testify may, in appropriate cases, be subject to forfeiture where conduct incompatible with the assertion of the right is at issue. 
They go on to discuss Allen, which was not a right to testify, but was a right to be present. And I am utilizing the guidance from Illinois versus Allen and State versus Anthony. It directly guides this court that a defendant may forfeit a right by conduct by doing something incompatible with the assertion of a right. In this particular case, you are very clearly telling me you are going to disregard what I told you about notifying the jury about nullification. You have absolutely no right to raise that in front of the jury. It is improper. And unless you're willing to tell me you will honor this ruling of mine, then you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument. That is my ruling. I object to that ruling, Your Honor. I object to that ruling. Are you willing to make a closing argument, sir, that does not reference jury nullification? I'm going to inform, inform the jury of their power. Again, I never stated that I was making a new jury instruction. I never sta uh, stated anything like that. And every case law that you just stated made no reference to closing arguments. It was all pertaining to uh, being present for the proceedings of trial and for testifying. Sir, Not what one I'm telling time you did you, hold on, I let, Your Honor, with all due respect, I let you make your record. I didn't interrupt you. Go ahead. Not one case law that you just cited made any reference whatsoever to a closing argument. Not one. So how is me merely informing the jury of the power and the rights that they have, how is that a forfeiture of being able to give a closing argument? Well, in addition to the cases I've just cited, sir, I'd also point you to State versus Bajerkus, 163 Wisconsin 2nd at 549. Well, that's a, lot of, that's that's a, a court of appeals cases, case from 1991. That is the first published appellate decision in Wisconsin to consider directly several issues relating to the jury nullification issue. In that particular case, the court very clearly said that the defense counsel in that case was allowed to talk in terms of fairness in general terms, but not to go further and could not argue that the jury, quote, should disregard the instructions and the law and find her not guilty because it seems fair. That's a description of jury nullification. To use the words jury nullification would run afoul even more. And so I am telling you that given my inherent authority in controlling the mode and order of this court to ensure courtesy, decorum, and civility, and to ensure that this jury is presented with arguments that are proper under the law, I am hereby telling you I am in, in creating a rule for your closing argument that you may not raise the issue of jury nullification in any way. Your Honor, hold up. Hold up now. I'm the only one that has to be made rules for it for closing arguments, but not the prosecution? How is that fair? How is that balanced? Mr. Brooks, I'm squarely faced with your defiance regarding the issue of jury nullification. It's that not is defiance. requiring it's me not defiance. to address this issue and to tell you very Honor, expressly I that that is the rule I vehemently for your object closing to that. argument. I vehemently object to that. Your objection is noted for the record. But May I ask for a legal reconsideration stands. of your ruling? That request is denied. May I uh, respectfully ask for, uh, matter of fact, I reject that ruling and take exception to that ruling. Your for the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling? Not one pertaining to being present in the courtroom or testifying. One that specifically talks about a closing argument.
All of those requests are noted. I will not reconsider. I've put my findings and my reasoning on the record, and I stand by that record. For the record, may I respectfully request a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for interlocutory declaratory appeal on this matter? I'm not the forum for which an appeal would be sought, sir. I cannot well, answer that. You, you referred to it before. You would need so to direct your appeal to, a, confused, your to Honor, a court of appeals, not this court. No, this is, I'm supposed to be in this admiralty court because you haven't, you haven't, is the, if, if we're under Article 3, then we should be in common law court. That hasn't even been addressed if we're in a common law court or an admiralty court. That's a baseless argument, sir. I don't and even need to address it. what law in fact? Based on what law in fact? It's meritless. Based on what law in fact? Sir, I intend to bring this jury out and give you I'm an opportunity I'm informed of that. to present a closing argument. Yeah, if but you you're violate, also, you're please also, let me, but listen, sir, you're interrupting you me yet rule, again. You just tried to put me under a rule that no one else was put under. The circumstances require that I implement this rule, sir, given your stubborn defiance don't. on your the Honor, issue of jury nullification. To my defense. You can't place me under certain rules and not place the prosecution under the same rules. Sir, the circumstances of this case and your insistence on arguing jury nullification has resulted in I this court creating this rule. I haven't argued it. I said that I wanted to inform the jury of their power. I never once said... I'm going to make an argument. I'm going to give them a jury instruction. You may not advise them that. or make them aware in any way that they have the power. And why not? Jury why can't they be informed of their power? Because it would violate the Bajurkas decision, sir. Violate what decision? All right, sir. I am going to bring the jury out. And I'm going to inform them that they have the power. And if you do that, I will dismiss the jury. And I will declare that your right to present a closing argument Under what has been law? forfeited based upon I make oral, how I've outlined I make that today. I'm going to declare that at this point because I want to see what you will do. Uh, but if you raise the issue of jury nullification, I will immediately dismiss the jury. You will forfeit your right you can't to do that. Uh, present a closing under argument. Under what lawful law can you? And then if you continue to interrupt under what me. what lawful law? You will be removed to the other courtroom as I complete the So I'm being held in contempt again. Is it civil or criminal? Your Honor. Uh, go ahead. I apologize. May I ask the court to consider perhaps an alternative, and I fully respect the ruling the court has just made, and I understand the basis for it. We all know the defendant in his petulance will say jury nullification in the first three seconds the jury's in the room. Objection the, to that proper I don't thing think to do, I, I think you're asking. Stop interrupting, Attorney Opper, I don't think Opera, I should be talked down to. Allow him to make his closing argument. I will object if he misstates the law. You can instruct the jury to disregard any misstatements of the law. And we continue in that fashion, if possible, for a reasonable amount of time. And if it becomes to the point where there's no reasonable, legal, credible argument that's being made, then the court can decide as to whether or not he's forfeited his right to a closing argument. But we could at least try to, by merely objecting and the court telling the jury to disregard and instructing Mr. Brooks to move on to the next topic, we could try to allow him his opportunity to provide a closing argument. If that's unworkable, then I think this record will be very clear as to the efforts of this court. And I think um, there, there is materials in the bench book, or I'm sorry, the jury instruction 705 um, that talk about a jury instruction this court could even give um, telling the jury that they are not at liberty to disregard the law. But we're not going that far yet because um, Frankly, you have told them and you will tell them that closing arguments are not evidence. And um, I think they will abide by that. So I know it's going to require um, effort for the court to, to allow this to um, allow Mr. Brooks to try and proceed. 
but I think we should try that or something similar to that in an effort to get through this next step or else we will continue at this pace forever. I'm certainly willing to try that. It's about all we could come up with, Your Honor. I mean, I'm certainly willing to try it in this courtroom and the, if he disregards that to excuse the jury and then have him present from the other courtroom would be the second step and then third would be a forfeiture. Agreed. Your Honor, I object to that. <clears throat> Your objection is noted for the record. That will be the course of action that this court takes. The first time you violate uh, the rule, you may be subject to forfeiting your right to be present where you will give the closing argument from the other courtroom. Um, and if you continue in a blatant disregard of the requirement that you not reference in any way jury nullification, I may make that final determination outside the presence of the jury. I object to that, Your Honor. All right, with that, let's bring the jury For out. For the record, may I respectfully request a legal reconsideration of your ruling? So is that a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer my objection, Your Honor? I decline to reconsider. I reject that ruling and take exception to that ruling, Your Honor. Noted for the record. For the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling, Your Honor? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully request a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law on this issue, Your Honor? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for interlocutory declaratory appeal on this matter? I'm not the court to address that. For the record, may I move to stay these proceedings until this instant matter is adjudicated by a court of competent jurisdiction, which this court has no All subject right. matter jurisdiction? Denied. Under, uh, based on what law or fact? for the jury, please. Based on what law or fact? because I'm going to inform the jury of their power. They deserve to know. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. <coughs> Go ahead, Mr. Brooks, your closing argument, please. Good afternoon. It's, it's been a long day. Uh, first off, I'd just like to start by uh, letting you guys know that uh, it's a lot of information that you guys should be privy to, I believe. And uh, one thing that I believe that you have not been privy to is the truth of your rights and your duties being the jury. Um, the fact that you and you alone have the power, not uh, well-prepared DAs with well-prepared and clearly rehearsed uh, speeches and, and exhibits and a lot of theatrics, frankly, not the judge. You and you alone have the power. You and you alone decide what is truth and what isn't truth. You should be informed that you have the power to nullify any law that you don't agree with. Objection. Move to strike the statement. Sustain. Objection. I will strike from the record the last statement made by the defendant. The jury which will is, disregard it. Which is clearly what I've been saying. I believe that not only is it fair 
but it's essential that you be privy to all knowledge, not knowledge that certain people feel that you should hear and shouldn't hear, disguised under the color of law. Um, the fact of the matter is, just like I did with uh, my opening um, statements, I don't have a well-prepared or rehearsed speech. Um, I didn't look in the mirror and say certain points to myself over and over again to make sure I have them right or, or anything like that. I've chosen to speak from the heart. In my opening statements, and now I'm gonna speak from the heart. What you won't hear me do is argue facts. And the reason you won't hear me argue facts is because I believe that it takes away from what should be recognized. The tragedy of this event, it should be recognized. <clears throat> Trying to argue facts of this, facts of that, I'm not going to waste your time doing that. It's a little emotional. I apologize for the long pause. It's hard to keep everything together emotionally. Um, and honestly, I don't believe that I have any more tears left. Um, it's, it's been a hard year um, for the families, mostly. Um, and that should not be lost on, on anyone. It, and it shouldn't be taken away. I said it before and I'll say it again. It's a lot of people that are, are healing, that are attempting to heal. Um, that opens the door to talk about uh, forgiveness for a little bit. Um, with every healing process, there comes a, a forgiving process. It's not an easy thing for anyone. Uh, what you've been hearing from the prosecution, and not to take anywhere with, uh, anything away from them, but let's call it what it is. You've been hearing a lot of rerun. Same things over and over and over. No different than when you turn on the radio and you first hear that song that you don't like when you first hear it. But they play it so much that eventually you start saying it, the words to yourself before you even realize it. And then you sit and you go, I hate that song. Why am I singing? That's what's been happening. Rerun. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And over. Attempting to make things stick in your head that simply aren't true. Why do I say what am I saying? I say look at the testimony. You know, the, the, the thing from the prosecution here has been intent, 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 intent. We all know what's been said. We all know the picture that's been painted. Even the prosecution said themselves. 
How can you look in somebody's head and say, this is what they intended to do? You know, for, for a year, I've, I've sat and gone through this feeling so powerless, you know, letting other people run with the narratives. <clears throat> Sitting back helpless while other people paint a picture that has zero truth, zero. I understand about healing myself, tragedy, pain, all that. A lot of it, there's no need to get into. Uh, I myself in my own life have had to do a lot of healing. As a man with children myself, I find it hard to believe that anyone who's really had conversations with me, spent time around me, would think for one second that this is an intentional act. I've never heard of someone intentionally trying to hurt someone while attempting to blow their horn. <coughs> while uh, attempting to alert people of their presence. Which brings me to more information that I believe that you should have been privy to. And I'm sure that the prosecution will beg to differ, but the fact of the matter is the vehicle in question make a model of 2010 Ford Escape. The vehicle in question, actually 2008, 2009, and 2010 of that model was in fact recalled. Objection, misstatement of the facts, facts not in evidence. Was in Improper fact. Improper argument, Your Honor. Sustained. Was in fact recalled. Was in fact a class action lawsuit against Ford Objection for those models evidence, for those honor. model vehicles. Sustain the jury will disregard information that you should have been privy to, that you weren't allowed to be privy to. Why I don't know. That information malfunctioning throttle bodies. Mr. Brooks, move out. It's information that you should have been privy to. Vehicles that malfunction and accelerate not being able to be stopped. Objection, that is key. It's information, it's, it's information. Hold on. Go ahead. Move to strike statements by Sorry Mr. for Brooks. the interruption. There are facts not in evidence, Your Honor, and it's complete misstatement. Sustained. Strike How's please. it a misstatement when I have the information? Mr. Brooks, move on. This is information that I feel like you needed to know. You should have known. Information that was taken away from you. Why, to prove a case? 
information that you definitely should have been privy to. says the defendant has an utter disregard for human life. Utter disregard for human life. Not realizing that they're talk about a, talking about someone that has, again, has children. Talking about someone that watch their children come out of the womb and be born into this world, cut the umbilical cord, held them before their mom even did. Moments that I'll never forget. And yet they say disregard, utter disregard for human life. They made reference to a rage as if they were, or if this particular DA was right there, standing right there, as if this DA is a psychiatrist. I said to myself, what, rage, what do you mean rage? How can you characterize that? How can you have the audacity to diagnose what someone's brain is? It, it, where it's at, what it's thinking, why it thinks the way it does. DA makes references to blocks of no one being injured, but then says it's intentional. You add that up with the supposed rage, the supposed intent to harm and kill, and it doesn't doesn't kick in until well within blocks. And maybe it's just me, but I would think if I was characterizing someone with this intent to kill and, and, this, and this, this rage and this anger then why weren't people immediately harmed? Why was someone with intent to kill and rage try to alert people of their presence, repeatedly honk their horn? You, you heard a detective, if you recall, testify that the vehicle that he observed was not only honking his horn, but was not speeding. So where does this rage kick in? Where this, this insatiable <coughs> intent to kill kick in. They speak as someone who's known someone for years. Which brings me back to the vehicle. What if the vehicle couldn't stop because of the malfunction? Objection, fact, not in evidence. What if, what if the driver of the vehicle was unable to stop the vehicle?
because of that fact, what if the driver may have panicked? Does that make the driver a, a crazed, or not crazed, a, 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 a rage? Does that make the driver in a rage and intent on killing people? DA played a exhibit 17. You don't see anyone struck in that vehicle. On that exhibit, you don't see anyone struck. With someone who had this intent to kill, this rage, as, as she says, If that was their intent, wouldn't they have taken the opportunity to hit as many people as they could? Target people, mow down people. Reference was made to this vehicle, the damage says this is all caused by bodies but then later turns around and says hits barricades and other objects for her testimony about hearing loud crashes and, and, and things of that nature but the DA wants you to believe that this all came from people Evidence doesn't support that. So I go back to trying to wrap my head around everything that's happened in the last year. Praying for those families, praying for the people that tragically lost their life because that should not be lost either. The fact that there was lives lost and all the emphasis has been put on the alleged defendant. And the people have been disregarded. Makes me wonder, does the DA even care about those people? been prayers going up every day. It's been suffering on both sides. It's been threats, hate mail. because of the narratives that's been put out there. The misconceptions that have been put out there. The lies that have been put out there. Lies that have caused my children not to be able to go to school. To be bullied. for my mother to have to leave her home and stay at a hotel because she's afraid for her safety. Because she gets hate mail shoved through her, her mailbox. My nieces and nephews to fear for their safety. What's been equally hard is not only 
having to answer questions from my daughter who was seven at the time, my baby, my baby girl who was seven at the time, is now eight. Attempting to ask, answer her questions that she's asking and still continue to shield her from what she sees, what she hears. Having a newborn son that I haven't even been able to meet. I haven't been able to hold, touch, kiss. Having to navigate everything that comes with this whole situation. while still attempting to wrap my head around it. I can't honestly say how many times I've sat in my cell, especially during lights out, alone, where it's just you. And just been <laughs> Praying and asking myself, how could this happen? Not just for the people, but for everybody involved, the community too. How could this happen? How? hardest questions you can ask is those that don't have an answer. No matter how much thinking you do, no matter how much you try to look at it from different perspectives and listen to other outside perspectives and listen to people that you trust and that you love. Still coming up with nothing. But to think for one second, one 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 question I never had to ask was if this was intentional. That's something that never even I never asked once, because I know it wasn't. As a matter of fact, it never even crossed my mind to even attempt to ask myself that, because I know it wasn't. I know sometimes during this trial probably doesn't show. Maybe hard to believe. But trust me when I say no one outside of the families that had to go through this, no one's heart is more in pieces than mine. So again, I go back to all these exhibits. Go back to everything that's been shown, everything that's been testified to.
everything you've heard during this whole process, this trial? And again, I say the same thing that I said earlier. Same thing I said in opening statements. I'm not reading from any paper, any books. Everything you've heard in opening statements, everything you're hearing now is from right here. Everything. <coughs> you have the decision. You and you alone, all of you, you have the decision. I'm sure you've taken a lot of notes during this process. Some days are longer than others. A lot of movement in and out of the courtroom for various reasons. Remember the power that you have. Don't for one second let it be taken away from you. I can never understand the position of sitting on a jury in, in something of this magnitude. So I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure. I pray that the right decision is made. the right decision. So almost like that, um, that message, well not message, but that writing we're in our vehicles and it, we got that rear view mirror and it said things are closer than they appear. But it's also another way of saying sometimes things aren't as they appear. can't speak for anyone else but me myself I believe in Jesus Christ that's how I was raised that's what I believe in none of us are perfect I try every day to make sure that I acknowledge him. That's why every time I step in this courtroom, I have my Bible with me everywhere I go. I even read it on breaks, recesses. This is not something that started at the beginning of this incident. This is something that has been instilled in me since I came out of the womb. 
this is how my family lives their life. This is how we was raised. for whatever mistakes that I myself have made in my life, I've made peace with, with God. Made peace. I'm happy to say that my conscience is clear. Because I believe, I trust him with my life. <laughs> Nobody will never know why it was his will for this to happen. A lot of lives were changed that day, mine included. <coughs> God's way is not our own. And no matter how much sometimes we want to question, we have to have faith. Look inside yourself. Look inside yourself and make the right decision. inside your heart. You have everything in your hands now. Everything. <laughs> Do was right. Do was right. Don't let the smoke and mirrors take away your power. Don't let the theatrics take away your power. Each and every one of you has a decision.
Ms. Wright. Make the right decision. hard to think about my younger kids getting older and at some point having to explain everything to them <coughs> kids don't stay kids forever Nowadays, kids is frankly a lot smarter than we were when we was kids. I tell you that much. I got a letter the other day. My youngest daughter. She's still learning cursive right now, so she's the best writer when it comes to cursive. She'd rather print. She said, Dad, and this is from the letter. She said, Dad, why are people saying all these mean things about you? I haven't read the rest of that yet, letter yet. <laughs> the rest of that sentence said, <laughs> That's not the dad I know. <laughs> Throughout this year, I've been called a lot of things. Fear, I am a lot of things. A murder is not one of them. Never has been, never will be. Before I close my statements, I just want to say open your hearts.
go inside yourself when making this decision. Have no fear. <laughs> Pray and do what you know is right. <laughs> what you know is right. Think about everything you've heard. Think about everything you haven't been privileged to hear. Think about the whole entire picture. Above everything, whatever you decide, make sure you yourself can live with it. Make sure you can live with it. That's the magnitude of the power that you have. <coughs> Just like this tissue is in my hand, this is everything. You have everything. Be at peace with what you decide. Had no regrets. Don't let this decision weigh on you after it's over. Hopefully we got a long lot lot of living ahead of us. Lord willing. Don't look back and kick yourself in the behind. Spend about three weeks with you. Took a lot of courage and a lot of guts to pause your life for this. To put important things on hold, to, to basically stop your life. You should be commended for being able to sit up here with this amount of pressure. I want you guys to know that's not lost on me. I'm sure it's a lot. And you all should be commended because it, it, it took courage to do this. I don't know, but I would bet a lot of people wouldn't want to be sitting in your position right now. And you guys had the guts to do it.
thank you for that. Thank you for taking pretty much a month and setting it to the side for this. I know it's probably not proper, but you, you guys deserve a round of applause if you could get one. Thank you guys sincerely. And and I know and I and I have faith and I trust that. guys know what's right ladies and gentlemen I, just, I don't think it's fair to just say guys but I believe in your heart you know you know what's right thank you Uh, before I give the state an opportunity um, to present rebuttal, please stand for a minute. So please stand. Have a seat, please. And Attorney Opper, I did time both closings. You have 1328 left. Thank you, Judge. I don't think that'll be an issue. <coughs> Folks, let me just say this. Mr. Brooks stands here and professes to speak to you from his heart. He plays on your sympathy, he talks about his children talks about the hardships that he's encountered and his family's encountered. And he brushes over the loss to the community. He wants to talk about how he's never held his newborn son, never once acknowledges the Sorensen family, the Owen family, the Duran family, the Hospital family, the Kulik family, Sparks family. Never once. It's nice that Mr. Brooks can get letters from his loved ones. I don't know why he did this. I told you that. But actions define a person. It's that simple. You can stand with the Bible in your hands all day long and profess to be the finest man under God that you can be. But when you drive through a parade route and roll over children, children with band instruments, to the extent that your vehicle heaves up and down, your intent is known, Mr. Brooks. It doesn't have to be guessed. It's known. You don't have to stand and wonder as he claims to. For him to keep going after he drove over those children in the band and have Jackson Sparks fly off the front hood of his car, lifeless, and keep going. And have Jane Kulik fly off the, light, the hood of his car, run her over, and keep going. I'm not going to go on. You get it. You need to look in the mirror, Mr. Brooks. If you want to accuse me of practicing my closing <coughs> argument, you need to look in the mirror, sir. Your actions are that of a murderer. 
You murdered these six people. You endangered the safety of 61 others. There are 68 victims in this case, folks. That's not an accident. That's not a, gee, I woke up one day and don't know how I found myself in this position. If you have some explaining to do to your children, Mr. Brooks, I recommend you do it. Now, members of the jury, the duties of the parties and the court have been performed. The case has been argued by the parties. The court has instructed you regarding the rules of law which should govern you in your deliberations. The time has now come when the great burden of reaching a just, fair, and conscientious decision of this case is to be thrown wholly upon you, the jurors, selected for this important duty. You will not be swayed by sympathy, prejudice, or passion. You will be very careful and deliberate in weighing the evidence. I charge you to keep your duty steadfastly in mind and as upright citizens to render a just and true verdict. You are to decide only whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the offenses charged. Any consequences of your verdict are matters for the court alone to decide and must not affect your deliberations. The following 76 forms of verdict will be submitted to you concerning the charges against the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks. Count one, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count two, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count two of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count two of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count three, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count three of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count three of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count four, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> count four, we, sorry, count four, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count four of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count four of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count five. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count five of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count five of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count six. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree <coughs> intentional homicide as charged in count six of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count six of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count seven. 
One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count seven of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count seven of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count eight. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count eight of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count eight of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count nine. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree <laughs> recklessly endangering safety as charged in count nine of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count nine of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 10. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 10 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 10 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 11, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 11 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 11 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 12, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 12 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 12 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 13. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 13 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 13 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 14, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 14 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 14 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous <coughs> weapon? Count 15, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 15 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 15 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 16. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 16 of the information. Another reading, 
we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 16 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 17, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 17 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 17 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 18, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 18 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 18 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 19, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 19 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly <coughs> endangering safety as charged in count 19 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 20, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 20 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 20 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 21, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 21 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 21 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 22, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 22 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 22 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering <coughs> safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 23, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 23 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 23 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 24, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 24 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 24 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 25. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, 
not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 25 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Gerald E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 25 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 26, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 26 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 26 of the information. <clears throat> if you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 27. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 27 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 27 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 28, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 28 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 28 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 29, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 29 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 29 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 30. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 30 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 30 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 31, <laughs> one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 31 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 31 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 32, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 33 of the information. That should be 32. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 32 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon. We're gonna have you take a short stand break while I confer with Madam Clerk. <coughs> <coughs> <coughs>
measuring how long the verdict forms are, but this will need to be corrected. So I need yeah. a three. Okay, well, you could read one twice and then I'll make another one. you're ready, have a seat. Count 33. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 33 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 33 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 34, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 34 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant Daryl E. Brooks guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 34 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 35, one reading, we the jury find the defendant Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 35 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 35 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly, recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 36, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 36 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 36 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 37, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 37 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 37 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 38, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 38 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty a first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 38 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 39, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 39 of the information. Another reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 39 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. 
did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 40. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 40 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 40 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 41. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, <coughs> Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 42. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety is charged in count 42 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 42 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 43. One reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 43 of the information. Another reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 43 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, Answer the following question, yes or no. <coughs> Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 44. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41, sorry, 44 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 45, one reading, we the jury find the defendant Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 45 of the information. <coughs> Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 45 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 46, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 46 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 46 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 47. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 47 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 47 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty, a first degree recklessly endangering safety? Answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 48, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty 
of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 48 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 48 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 49, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 49 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 49 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 50, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 50 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 50 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 51, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 51 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 51 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 52, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 52 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 52 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 53, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 53 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering <coughs> safety as charged in count 53 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 54, one reading, we the jury find the defendant Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 54 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 54 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 55, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 55 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 55 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 55 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? I think I'll give my jurors one more stand break before I conclude. So please stand and anyone else in the courtroom, please. <coughs> You can. Yeah. 
them to this. Yep. And here's if you want these too. For now. That's more. Oh yeah, I did redid all this. Oh, did it? Yeah. Thank you. Have a seat. Count 56. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 56 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 56 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 57, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 57 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 57 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 58. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 58 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 58 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 59, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 59 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 59 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 60. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 60 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 60 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 61, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 61 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 61 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 62, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 62 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 62 of the information. If you find the defendant <coughs> guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 63, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 63 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty 
of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 63 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 64. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 64 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 64 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 65, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 65 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 65 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer all of the answer the following question yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 66. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count seven. Count 60. Six of the information. I'll just repeat count 66. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 66 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 66 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 67. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 67 of the information. <coughs> Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 67 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 68. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 68 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 68 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident cause death to Virginia Sorensen? Count 69. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 69 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 69 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident cause death to Leanna Owen? Count 70. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 70 of the information. <coughs> Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 70 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident cause death to Tamara Durand? Count 71. One reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, 
not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 71 of the information. <coughs> Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 71 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident cause death to Jane Kulik? Count 72. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 72 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 72 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident cause death to Wilhelm Hospital? Count 73. One reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 73 of the information. Another reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 73 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident cause death to Jackson Sparks? Count 74. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of bail jumping as charged in count 74 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of bail jumping as charged in count 74 of the information. Count 75. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of bail jumping as charged in count 75 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of bail jumping as, count, as charged, excuse me, in count 75 of the information. Count 76. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of battery as charged in count 76 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of battery as charged in count 76 of the information. It is for you to determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of each of the offenses charged. You must make a finding as to each count of the information. Each count charges a separate crime and you must consider each one separately. Your verdict for the crime charged in one count must not affect your verdict on any other count. This is a criminal, not a civil case. Therefore, before the jury may return a verdict which may legally be received, the verdict must be reached unanimously. In a criminal case, all 12 jurors must agree in order to arrive at a verdict. When you retire to the jury room, select one of your members to preside over your deliberations. The presiding juror's vote is entitled to no greater weight than the vote of any other juror. If you need to communicate with the court while you are deliberating, send a note through the bailiff signed by the presiding juror. To have a complete record of this trial, it is important that you communicate with the court only by a written note. If you, have any, if you have questions, the court will talk with the parties before answering, so it may take some time. <coughs> you should continue your deliberations while you wait for an answer. The court will answer any questions in writing or orally here in open court. <coughs> when you have agreed upon your verdict, have it signed and dated by the person you have selected to preside. After you have reached a verdict, the, the presiding juror will notify the bailiff that a verdict has been reached. Everyone will return to the courtroom. The verdicts will be read into the record in open court. The court may ask each of you if you agree with the verdicts. Before I swear the officers, I will, uh, we will determine the alternates, and then I will have all of the civilian bailiffs and deputy bailiffs that will be in charge of the jury during their deliberations and sequestration.
of stuff up here. A little bit pushed in. There, there we go. go. I counted and recounted 15. So we have placed each one of your numbers in the tumbler. I'm going to draw three numbers. Those numbers will be the alternates um, who will nonetheless be sequestered in the event we would need to call upon one of you to replace another juror. The first number that I am pulling out is 10. The second number I am pulling out is 30. And the third number I am pulling out is 1. I want to confirm that I still have 12. I know Madam Clerk did it, but I will also do that to be sure. just confirmed that the other 12 numbers were in there. I'll put those back in and then we'll make a record of that. All right, then I will need all of the deputies and civilian bailiffs to be come up and be sworn on the record for the sequestration and um, I'll go ahead and do it. to court pause why don't you join them just in case you're needed all right would you all please raise your right hand do you swear that you will keep all jurors on this trial together in some private and convenient place and that you will not allow any person to speak to them or you speak to them yourself, except to ask whether they have agreed on their verdict, and that you will not, before they render their verdict, communicate to any person the state of their deliberations or the verdict they have agreed upon, so help you God. All right, and then Madam Clerk will just make a record of who you all are. Um, it will take us a moment just to have all the <coughs> finalized um, paperwork to go back with the jury. I do have all of the verdict forms if I want to get that to All right, and here are the jury instructions as well. For the record, it's 624. All rise for the jury as they're excused to begin their deliberations. Thank you. Uh, you may be seated. 
uh, just so the record is clear. The alternates, of course, will not be uh, participating in the deliberations. They will be in a separate jury deliberation room um, and will only be called upon if needed, of course, after consultation with um, the parties. As far as how late, I will let them deliberate tonight. We have ordered dinner for them. I believe it will be here shortly. Um, and I really will leave it up to them as to how late they want to deliberate uh, before they would want a break and then to retire for the evening. They are under a sequestration order, so they will be kept separate and apart. Their electronics have been confiscated um, and they will um, not be going home uh, until verdicts have been reached or they are discharged from the court, whichever would occur sooner. Anything uh, else the parties would want me to address at this moment? From the state? From the state. Thank you, Jeff. Anything from you, sir? <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> so essentially, I'm going to have to stay here while they're delivering. I'm going to be able to go back to my unit, use the phone, shower. It is shower day for my pod. We only get <laughs> two shower days a week. I don't. So here's what could happen, though, sir. I don't have a problem with you doing that, but they could have questions. And then, so, and then you would need to become available so we could address any questions. They may ask for exhibits. Uh, things of that nature. So as long as you're willing to come back for those things, I don't have an issue if, you know, I, I probably should talk to the COs or at least the sheriff and make sure there's, I'm not stepping on their toes since they're in charge of all of that. Um, but it's possible that we get a request for exhibits, some exhibits initially that would, I wouldn't be surprised if we got that. Um, so let me do this. Let me confer with the sheriff's department. I don't initially see an issue with that, but I want to make sure that they have a protocol in place and that's what they would like to do as well, okay? And one more thing. Go ahead. I was, um, I was curious, uh, 61 charges for the uh, reckless. 61 injured parties did not testify. So how does that work? How, how how do how essentially how are charges able to be charged if all the injured parties did not testify from my perspective sir the state uh, presented their theory of the case and there was sufficient uh, evidence uh, regarding the charges to go forward to the jury um, i can't further explain it from there because that would for me, that would require me to explain the law. Um, and I guess that's all I can really say about it at this point. I got um, a point, though. I'm sorry? I got a point, though. Um, I'm not going to comment on that, sir. Um, of course, the state bears the burden of proof. Um, and they have to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, for better or for worse, sir, I was not presented with any motions to dismiss, either at the end of the state's case or the close of the evidence, regarding any legal arguments you may have had regarding those issues. Um, and so at this point, um, the jury has the case, and they will determine their verdicts. If there are issues of law that you want to raise after the verdicts are received, um, then you'll have to make that determination. Yeah, that, that has to be raised because it's essentially you can't, if no injured party testifies, then there shouldn't be a charge. I disagree with that characterization, sir, but there is frankly no motion in front of me based in law or fact, so t for me to comment any further would require me to give an advisory opinion, which I'm not um, willing to do. So you're saying I need to make, make a motion? So what I will say at this point is I do have one issue that I would like to raise with the parties. Um, I frankly would just, I need a break a little bit. I mean, obviously the court has to stay open. Um, I know my dinner is coming. Um, 
and I think it's uh, reasonable. I need to put a few things together, but I do need to make a record of some information that I received earlier today um, so that the parties are advised of that. But I will do that. Um, um, let me confer with the Sheriff's Department about your requests. Um, I'd like to take about, a, in about 30 minutes, address the issues that I need to address or the issue. Um, and I, I want to find out if that would interfere with your request about taking a shower and all of that. So um, if you can hold tight and stay with us for a little bit, um, that would be great. And I'll confer uh, with the Sheriff's Department and have a more definitive answer for you shortly, okay? Can I get my filings? Um, you want the, we have, you want the originals back. If Madam Clerk has scanned them all in, and they're uploaded, I don't have an issue giving you the originals back. They will have the date stamp. They don't have a time because they were filed in court. Won't you put the time on? I also, so that you, they were in there, printed them after I scanned them in so it has a document number. So you're getting two copies. So you'll have that, okay? See, so I didn't interrupt you, see? I'm sorry? I said, see, I didn't interrupt you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Unless there's, I would like the parties back in about a half an hour. Okay. Thank you. Unless they have a question sooner. Your Honor, do I have to go in that holding cell or do I got to get to go?